You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So today, I was wondering, Father, if we could take a step back and talk about the Greek epics and why they were written. What was their purpose so that we can better understand the counterpoint that the Bible was trying to make? Two points to begin with. Number one, since we heard several times that scripture was written as an anti-epic because we hear that the protagonists, the heroes, those interested and about whom scripture was written were belittled which is extremely strange. Usually, uh, Epic does not do that. It promotes national identity and so on, speaks highly of the people, and this is very obvious in the Epics. The other one is that Epic means a long word, a stretched word, a saga. Interestingly, in Arabic, the Epics are translated as milhamat and the plural malahim from the verb, which the people who know Hebrew know, nilham, laham, which is when two swords are wielded, touch one another, and thus it's a war epic. That's the whole thing. (laughs) It's very clear in Arabic, laham is the welder. That's the meaning. So the Arabs had it. But to be fair, the forebears of the writers of scripture had their own stories and epics and so on, mainly about the gods. And thus, it's something human, if you like, natural, where the human tried to preserve oneself. But the Achilles heel of this whole business is that you preserve yourself in the way you perceive yourself the moment you write. Well, to be able to write, you have to have a civilization, obviously, and libraries and cities and so on, especially when you're writing an epos, a long saga. You can do it also by memory, but still it was present in the cities of Babylon. Now, the old Hellene civilization developed precisely around cities. That was the main reference. Let's remember Athens and Sparta. But, and that's very important, they were newcomers compared to the civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt. And thus, to assert oneself, as Rome will do later, again, let me go on an aside that I mentioned earlier, a newcomer has always to present oneself as somehow older than one is, because novelty is linked with usurping. It's someone that is new. It's like Zeus, for instance. He had to unlodge his parents, the Titans, and so on. But then, you know, you have to present him as a god who has always been, and so on. Notice how when you want to introduce a president or a bishop, suddenly you have a long bio. Well, the bio doesn't apply to that person at that point, because one was not president before one became president and one was not bishop before one became bishop. You know my joke in the class when I say the students refer to Father Paul in Romania. Well, when I was a student in Romania, there was no Father Paul, but that's what people do, the retrojection. It's part of the deal. I'm not saying it's good or bad. That's the system. So the Greeks had to do that. They came about during the Persian Empire that was extremely powerful, and they realized majestic deeds. Actually, they were entitled, humanly speaking, humanly speaking, to such epics. They won great battles that were historical. And that would be the background of the great national literature. And in these, we have if you like, a prehistory of the actual Greece 
notice you speak about people who were totally in the past and you push it to the extreme as being semi-gods notice in the bible in chapter 5 the people lived long lives and i explain it as being kind of parallel to the list of kings that lived lengthily then the sons of god in genesis 6 the kings and so on that's how people do it the forefathers are always praised how many times i repeated that when scripture belittles the forefather is something unacceptable you have to speak highly and the two major lengthy stories are the Iliad and the Odyssey the Iliad is very interesting according to me there is nothing historical in the sense or specifically so but it's just a rendering of the expansion and the founding of Greek society and one can see that it speaks about the unity of the different cities this is how you do something we americans here can refer to that when we speak about the beginning of the united colonies and then the united states and this lingers even in the name of the country the united states and it's a battle athens and sparta fought for a long time so i believe whatever it is it doesn't matter it's an appeal for unity remember how the story goes when people wanted to go home and others said no we have to be with agamemnon and really be together and this is reflected later in the story of achilles when he pouted against agamemnon the greeks almost lost the battle this is what is stressed that we have to be united we cannot have different heroes each hero fights the other and we can do that we have to somehow unite we have to meld together and be one again that's my view and the view of many people that it intended to unite it's not that it was describing something that happened which by the way shows that scripture could have been written from the same not perspective but in the same way that it wants to bring people like sheep of one flock this unity is very important it's not bad per se it is bad when it is used as in genesis 11 with the people wanting to aggrandize themselves against the deity that's not good but the trouble is that when we aggrandize ourselves it is at the expense of the people who are grander than we are and that's why it's ultimately the sin of pesha revolt against the gods but notice how in the greek approach it was presented positively you know the revolt of zeus and his brethren against the titans and that's what the epics were all about in the iliad i must stress that, that it was not against a foe as an outsider because troy was a greek colony was another city like athens and sparta so the conglomerate of the cities in greece proper wanted to bring troy in their fold this point has to be underscored was not against an outsider but insider and that's why i stress the unity now when you hear it you will see that there is no differentiation technically between gods and human beings mainly the heroes in the sense that in between them you have ultra heroes or semi-gods take for instance hercules and achilles and so on a mother is divine or the father is divine that's part of the deal otherwise how can you make someone special you have to present that person with special traits and the goddesses are involved and so on and so forth so that's the intention of the epic in presenting the heroes as entitled to that now they are not presented as anti-gods but the gods are obviously with them again let's remember that in scripture it's the opposite obviously in scripture god is for the human beings but the human beings are very early on and consistently against 
God. Now, this is continued in the second part, which is very important, the Odyssey, where again we have fights and so on, but it's in a different direction where somehow one would have to return home. And Odysseus, Ulysses, is presented as the hero of the Iliad, actually. It is through him that the war was won at the end, remember the Trojan horse. But he had to come back home and to live in Greece. Notice how I believe that the interest ultimately is in their, let's call it, homeland. And he goes back and he wanted to stay in his isle and live there. And he goes through another epic where he is lost for another 10 years in the wilderness of the Mediterranean Sea, if I may put it this way. And he has to fight, remember the fight with the Cyclops and so on again. It's feats of power. And Ulysses returns home as the one who was the winner of the battle of Troy, and nothing and no one could stop him. And again, you have here goddesses involved and witches and so on. But mainly in the case of Ulysses, Athena, which was the goddess of wisdom, very, very important. And it's the goddess that gave its name to the city Athens. Athens is the plural of Athena. Athens was the important city. It is there that also philosophy developed later. So that would be the intention of every epic. That's how it is. Remember what I said at the beginning, that in Arabic, we call an epic war, a great war, fighting with the swords. And all this came with Alexander. Actually, Alexander surpassed all those epics. Actually, he realized them historically. The Iliad and the Odyssey are not historical, but Alexander, at least 90% of what is said about him is historian. Very impressive. And again, against the Persians against whom the Greeks fought. Remember, Alexander was Macedonian, not Greek. But all this was expressed in the Hellenic language, Greek language. And you know my thesis, how the conquered leaders of Mesopotamia came up with scripture to counter that, but from a totally different perspective. That is what they fought against. Remember, I view the Philistines from the verb falash, meaning Alexander and his cohorts, you know, spreading, and Goliath, the armed man, is obviously a stand-in of Alexander because the Philistines have no business in the whole story there. It's just on the side at the beginning of the kingdom of Saul. And you have David as a shepherd that fights him. We talked about all that, but it's good at this point at the end that my hearers will see the inter connection that we have, this epic rendered also in the Bible, but always it ends badly, according to the prophets, especially Isaiah and Amos and Nahum. God, the general of the armies, will fight against his armies, which is unheard of. So in this sense, it is an anti-epic. But unfortunately, and I need to finish with that, scriptural criticism developed in Europe, and Europe is cursed with this approach to identity, identity, the I and the we. And one brings this when one looks at scripture, and this is how it is misconstrued. And this is where I always present theology as a calamity. You begin with presuppositions, which are always your presuppositions in the sense that even if you don't come up with them, but you endorse them, and you start projecting that into anything you read. And at one point, you're going to find something that supports you. There are lots of epics <laughs> in the Bible. And you start reading it, and God created man in his image. As Professor Roddy says, well, if man is in the image of God, then this means that man is not God. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it means. Scripture is anti-epic. It criticizes the epics. Only God is allowed to be epic, if I may say so. And the readers, especially of Isaiah, will remember that in my teaching, I stress that the same word, ge'ut, which is grandeur, greatness, arrogance, superlativity, just looks good on God. 
but when it is applied on the human being and the human being's realizations as temples and mounds and so on it's bad it's not good which means the same suit the goot of psalm 93 is good is beautiful only on god that you're not going to find in other epics it's impossible because epics are interesting in speaking highly of oneself and one's community, whereas the Bible is written to belittle these. One of the things we notice in the Iliad is that in the heavens, there are multiple wills of the different gods in the heavens, and that this is one of the conflicts that happens. And it seems like this is very starkly contrasted in the Bible, where there is a single heavenly will. How do you understand the relationship between the wills of the heavens in the epics versus the single will of the heavens of God in the Bible? In the epic, you need it. You have to have supporters. If you have two camps, then you have to have supporters for each of the camps. It's just basic logic. <laughs> and that's why the gods are many and divided at one point. They don't have to be divided all the time. But, you know, you have gods that are with these and gods that are with those. Actually, the Iliad begins with the feud between three goddesses, each considered herself as the most beautiful, and they needed a few judges, as you do on TV. You have to choose your judges. And, you know, they went for the human beings and... And the people sided. So it's interesting, really, to know the Iliad, but we don't have time. And people should read it just as is, not lingering. They should read it the way I suggest that the Bible would just first read it and listen to it. Now, in the Bible, and I have a long section on the plural Elohim, the name of God, hopefully my readers will have read that, there is a reason that in the Bible there is one God, which means you cannot blame the opponent and its gods. It's the same God. That's why he may side with you, against you, with the opponent. He can choose Cyrus and so on. It's very strange, but it works in the anti-epic. So the oneness of God is not philosophical, since there is one world, there is only one God, you know, in the Middle Ages, which is silly, because now we're stuck. We have many galaxies and many worlds, which means that you could have many gods. But scripture is not interested in that. It stresses that there is one God, which the Christians and the Jews always consider as positive for them. But scripture is cunning. If there is one God and he turns against you, then he is against you. You can't appeal to another nicer God. Notice this difficulty that was faced by the early church through Marcion and so on. I mean, somehow, you know, you want to get out of that by speaking about the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. I'm not saying that the church fared better than Marcion because the church went for always this God is good to us. <laughs> no, if God is one, then he is what he is at the time at which he is. And you have no appeal. And I believe this is the basis of the love of the neighbor, of the foe of the opponent. Remember the foreigner in the Old Testament and in Matthew, love your enemies. And so on. Precisely as Paul says in Romans, is God only the God of the Jews? No, he is the God of the Jews and the Gentiles, which mean both are as his, whether you would add people or not, is immaterial. And ultimately, as the one shepherd, at the end, he will have one flock. And that is something we don't understand. I mean, look at the TV shows. Unless you have car races and fights and so on, you don't have a story. You need to have an opponent. But early on, God tells you there is no opponent. Abel is not your opponent, Cain. You assume that he is your opponent. And ultimately, at the end in Isaiah, God says, I shall become their opponent. It's clearly to me anti. This is how I explain it, not in the sense whether the people would agree with me that it's nice, but I can't, you know how the people react, I can't accept this. No one is forcing you to accept scripture, but you have to be honest in listening 
to what scripture is saying. And because it is totally strange, until now, you know how we turn it around, we Christians and Jews, we turn it around, because it doesn't fit us. But it is there, and one has to explain what is the reason behind it, and we took our time on that that they came with something that has to be presented as untie. Listening to you and reflecting on the teaching of St. Paul and what you're saying about the epics and the biblical tradition, it seems to me there are two visions of what cultural pluralism can or should look like. The one comes out of the Hellenistic tradition, which I think in modern language is couched in words like diversity and empowerment, where you have different identities and you celebrate the fact that there are different identities. And then you talk about building up the different identities, which invariably leads to conflict. On the other side, you have the Apostle Paul, who is usurping the power of imperialism to say, look, you have different identities, and that's fine, but there's no power ascribed to any identity. And instead of giving that power to Caesar, who's just another human identity, we're going to give that power to the teaching so that all of the different identities, cultures, peoples can sit together at one table without giving up whatever they were when they were made by God. I want to just call that out because all of us obviously want Jew and Greek to sit together. But right now we're going through a kind of crisis in our culture because everybody wants to demand a seat at the table as opposed to being asked to the table by God. And it's calamitous. I mean, there are implications for embracing Hellenism. Oh, I agree with you. And one should remember that the goyim are in the plural and Israel is one of the goyim at many points. You know, you're not amalgamating the people. A Finn is a Finn and an Aztec is an Aztec. But scripture is saying you are making out of the Finns something called Finnism. And I am saying that ultimately they are all Adamic. That's the proposition of scripture. It's where you come from. The garbs, take, which are very important to express glory and richness and so on. Well, it depends. If you are in cold areas, you have to have a different garb. That's all. So the garb is no reference. And that is the thing about the richness, not only in gold and silver, but also in traditions. Take the classic, the British and the French can stand one another, but they congregate again the rest of the world and they destroy and they divide. They created the new Middle East and uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. Athens and Sparta can stand one another and Corinth and Agamemnon. Remember, Achilles was against that at the beginning. He didn't want to go to war and so on, but they come together for their own good. Now, the scripture solution is not ethical. Remember, my students will say that there are no ethics in the Bible. Ethics, it's a philosophical approach to justify yourself, ultimately. Was I good or bad? Yeah, you're my son. No, you're always good and so on. Why? Because you're my son and uh, don't worry about it. You're not that bad, you know. Notice the terminology. In the Bible, everybody is bad all the time, which is an impossibility, but that's the statement. In other words, stop dreaming and projecting. That's the reality, whether you like it or not. And that's why the story of Cain and Abel is, you know, my thesis that the Bible is already in its entirety in Genesis 1 through 4. Cain is eliminated. He doesn't have a genealogy. And Abel obviously is eliminated, but comes in his stead, Seth, and so on, who is the son of Adam. It's very powerful. And all this has to do with procreation, which all of us, because People, when I say Plato, Plato, I mean, people were Platonic before Plato. Plato just put it in words. The famous I. Once you say I, then you have to say the he and the she and so on. And the Bible doesn't allow you to say even we. The glory is only to God. He is the only I. I am who I am, meaning whatever I am. Again, the fathers make a big deal about there is no big deal. In other words, that's the deal in scriptures. The only one who has a legitimate ego is Elohim. That's it.
no one else. My glory I do not give to anyone else. You know, my interest ultimately, even through these podcasts, it's to clarify what scripture is saying. <laughs> I'm not proposing a new theory. Whatever scripture is saying. But I'm saying to understand it, to understand its strangeness, one has to figure out the background. Unfortunately, scholarship, especially in the last 100 years, promoted, you know, scripture was written to promote the identity, the identity of the writers and so. And that's why they put everything 200 years before my proposal as to when scripture was written. They make it another epic against the mighty Persians. In other words, they read it Greekly. And the fathers of the church were Greco-Roman, Roman, obviously, citizenship, but mentality. You have to speak about yourself. Just listen to the Jews and the Christians speaking about themselves and the Bible as though it's the same pot. <laughs> and criticism is always for improvement. Notice how the people like when the teachers say, uh, you're not that bad. Let's improve on what you have. I remember a student who told me, why do you tell us immediately at the beginning that you know nothing? Just sit down and listen. And she told me, can't you put it in another way? Whatever you know, we're going to improve on it. And hopefully at the end of the semester, you will know more. Notice, no more. In other words, you're knowledgeable and you're adding to your knowledge. There is no disruption at any point. And I'm asking my hearers, by Jove, is this what you hear in Scripture? <laughs> is this what you hear in Genesis 6 and in Genesis 11? And at the destruction of Samaria and Jerusalem, improve on what? That's the real tension. And I think we have to hear it. Just the fact that the scriptural God, when he's being taught, forces you to close your mouth and humble yourself and assume that you have nothing to contribute. Just that fact is so urgent because people's relationships don't work, people's communities don't work, people's ability to function in community is evaporating because no one is willing to humble themselves and make themselves a beta to the alpha of their neighbor. It's a disaster. Let's begin with the Orthodox. You know, I come from the Middle East. And what stunned me here in North America with the greatness of Orthodoxy that put many people together and so on. I have no problem with that. That is a place where you come. But the way it is presented by the bishops is a killer. Okay, now we have Serbs and Bulgarians and Russians and Arabs and Finns and so on. Here in America, each one would chip in his or her own tradition and we put them together excuse me you chip in my dear friend if you are israel or if you like the new israel it means you have no word to say when god was speaking that's why he is not seen he doesn't want to appear he absents himself as i say in the book on purpose now whom you would be talking to all you can do is to listen or to close your ears and hence comes the statement, those who have ears to hear. You're coming, Father Mark, from the experience around you, and I respect that, and the hearers have to hear it, because that's the problem. But my reaction comes directly from Scripture, where it was taken already into consideration. World War I and World War II, it's a repetition of Athens and Sparta. You have Westerners fighting one another, and they are so enamored of their ego, they call their war a world war. I know, because they involve other countries and so on. <laughs> but that's the way we are. Our little war, two neighbors together on your street, suddenly, I mean, if someone can direct a movie, you know, it's like movies. You make everything around these two contingents. It's a world war. My dear friend, the only world war, if you take literally literature, is the fight, or whatever you call it, between Cain and Abel. That's why you have Jewish scholars that say you have to be very careful when you kill someone because you may be killing half of humanity. It's very powerful. So we have to listen to Scripture and teach it. Teach it, as Paul asked Timothy, in good time and bad time. We have to teach it all the time.
and to open one's ears is to open one's scriptural heart to accept the statement. So the teachers of scripture, not of theology as most of us are, just teach scripture. And even as I did so often in my class, even if you don't like it, <laughs> you have to teach it. If I assign you to teach the Iliad, you have to teach the Iliad. But Westerners, Europeans, I say it in my book that the early Jews in Yehud with Joseph Flavius and so on were Westerners, you know, Romans. I mean, it's brilliantly there, the Maccabees. This is what Paul fought against. Remember, he was a Roman citizen. And he said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. You cannot make out of Romans the Neo-Greeks and side with them. Even if their emperor wanted to make them the ultimate Greece under one emperor, you are not bound by the emperor. Your Lord is the God of Scripture. At this age, <laughs> you could feel it in my, I don't know what to say anymore in the sense more than what I have said, you know, it's there, it's so obvious to me. The civil war, which was a battle between two views of identity, had the highest number of dead in the entire American history. It's unbelievable. And until now, it is reflected in the events and politics. We're living that. And yet, and this is what hurts me the most, is that all the promoters of religion appeal to the scriptural and distort it. Remember what Paul said about his colleagues who were at the same time his nemesis. They pervert, and I tackle this in my book, pervert, but I'm saying perversion started already then, otherwise Paul would not have mentioned it. And he condemned in Galatians, Galatians is a very important letter, Iuzaismos, very clearly something that finishes with ism at the end. And that's why in my book, when I critique Christianity, I invite my readers to hear it in the original Greek, which is Christianismos, Christianism. It's not Judaism and Christianity. It's Judaism and Christianism, and both isms are no good. But that's what theology did. It made Paul criticizing Judaism and promoted Christianism by appealing to Acts the first time people were called by Christ Christians in Antioch. Yes, but I don't find the word Christianismos in the New Testament. You have Jews and Christians, and it doesn't matter. They are supposed to be one people. But when you answer to an ism with another ism, and the funny thing is that many people said it in the last century. <laughs> the problem is with the isms. But it doesn't sound as powerful as it was when it was first used. It's a big thing. I think your proposal today was to tackle perhaps much more than one can chew in one session. But don't hope that I'm going to give you a different answer next time. No, it's going to be the same with more examples from Scripture. We don't want a different answer, Father Paul. <laughs> and I keep trying to explain that one of the great things about inscribing letters, whether it's on paper or on stone, they're there. <laughs> I think the greatest beneficence of my legacy to my students is that they are in a much, much better shape than I am because they are entitled to say to people who critique them. And if you think I'm bad, just listen to Father Paul. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a blessing <laughs> to point to someone and, else. And if you're struggling with Father Paul, listen to scripture <laughs> and then you'll realize how nice father paul is <laughs> yes yes that's why i love scripture it makes me look good <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much father paul it's a great yeah, great thank session you, thank you thank you thank you much the bible as literature is a production of the ephesus school network